publicly insinuated that I was a homosexual. <laughs> and? Oh, Beverly, no! You must have misunderstood. Attention, Republicans! Beverly Leslie is a homosexual. <laughs> I'm sitting here at the W Hotel with Leslie Jordan, who's about to have a show open tomorrow night in Atlanta, and we're going to talk a little bit about his background, some of the things he's done, and um, you know, where he's going in the f down the road. So, um, first of all, let me introduce him. This is Leslie Jordan. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. You know, we've loved you for years. It's been, what, close to 30 years that you've been performing and entertaining people with your humor. Well, 1982 was when I got to Hollywood. Of course, I fell out of the womb performing. <laughs> I've always been funny. I think that I was funny as a kid because I could keep the bullies at bay. But yeah, 1982. So what is that? 32 That's, years. Woohoo! That's a long time, and it's amazing because you're only what 35 now, right? Uh huh. I don't know how that happened. I don't know. You got an early start. That's 30, before the child labor laws. 35 plus tax and deposit. <laughs> So everybody knows you as um, Megan Mullally's nemesis from Will and Grace. I think that was probably one of the most widely recognized uh, roles you've had. Um, how, did, how did that all come about? I just auditioned. I have a whole story. It involves Joan Collins. They had written this part for Joan on Will and Grace. She was going to steal Rosario the maid. And then they were her and, and Megan Mullally were going to... Um, where's she go when her cameraman left? <laughs> her, um, you know, was going to um, uh, still uh, pull her wig off. And, and uh, anyway, Miss Collins, they were about to shoot the episode, and, and her people came and said, You can't pull Miss Collins' wig off. So they just auditioned. They fired her ass, and I just walked in and auditioned and got the part. And then they called a week later, and, and my manager said, you scored a big coup. They want you to um, do another episode. And then that's just kind of the way it started. I ended up doing about 12 in all um, over the years. And That was a pretty amazing show. Um, and um, now, if I'm not mistaken, I was looking at some of your, some of your background. The, was Fall Guy the first TV series that you actually appeared on? Yes. I'd forgotten about that. I did commercials mainly. In 1982, when I got off a bus from Chattanooga, Tennessee, I had $1,200 sewn in my underpants, and I had a little suitcase and a dream, and uh, I started taking situation comedy classes. I had a degree in theater from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, but I hadn't really worked in front of the camera that much. And the lady that ran the school said to me, you're just a commercial gold mine. And I said, what's that mean? She said, well, you should be doing commercials. This woman had done this commercial for um, Wendy's Hamburger. She said, where's the beef? Well, all of a sudden, they wanted characters. Up to that point, to be in a commercial, you had to be like a model. Right. So they wanted uh, uh, characters, and I started doing commercials. I did everything from Aunt Jemima light syrup to I was the elevator operator. I was as popular back then as Flo is on the progressive ads. I mean, seriously, I couldn't get down the street. I did so many television commercials. And then I got hired for um, The Fall Guy. And then I made a mistake. I went to a, an audition for TV, and the lady said, well, you're a good actor. I knew you did those commercials. I didn't know you could act. And I thought, well, you stupid bitch. How can I do 21 <laughs> commercials where you've got to do it in, what, 23 seconds? That's the best training ground. Well, I went to my commercial people and I said, listen, I want to pull back on the commercials because I want to do TV and film. Well, that was kind of like that redheaded boy leaving um, uh, Miami Vice, or who, what, what, remember that one, and Catherine Hagel, when they leave, uh, you know what I mean, when it, whatever makes you famous, you leave. Oh, yeah. Anyway, about a year later, I was back there begging, and said, I need some commercials, but by then I'd lost the... Well, you've recently broken some new ground, too, in that, in that category, because I think you're the first person around your height that's actually been a supermodel in a Doritos commercial. <laughs> 
That was, oh, that was going to make us famous. It was the Lane twins, who I just adore. They've got more ideas, and they, I'm their muse, like with Dale Shores. They just think up things for me to do. And they said, Leslie, it's gonna, we're going to win a million dollars, and we'll split it four ways. And I said, well, what have I got to do? Well, they set it all up, and we shot it, and we got more. We had something like 70,000 hits. But a lot of the hits on online and everything said, this is too gay. Well, then we'd go after them and say, what do you mean it's too gay? They said, there's no way they're going to run this during the Super Bowl. Well, they didn't. You know, we didn't even make it in the top 25. Yeah, it's all a conspiracy. It is. That's just the way things in this world operate sometimes. I don't even know why I'm here. <laughs> How y'all doing? Who's next? I'm next. You won't be needing that, bro. I'm your man. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Places and go bold. So tell us a little bit about um, the project that you've done with Del Short, Southern Baptist Sissies, and how much of an input you had into that, you know, given your Southern Baptist background. Well, Dale started writing that part, and, and, and as he always does, he loves to call me. It used to bug the shit out of me. Call and read it out to me. He wants to read it and act out all the parts. I'm like, just give me a script. Well, he'd call me and act this part out and act this part out and said, you're going to be, uh, 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 start telling, you're going to sit in a bar, and a uh, hustler bar, and uh, I'm going to talk about Fast Daddy, and I'm going to talk about, and I said, those were all stories. That's my life story. Right. Seriously. I sat in that bar with a cocktail in this hand and an ATM card in this hand with all those boys. All those boys that Peanut talks about, Fast Eddie, Booyah, um, Italian Joe, they were real people. Del Shore stole every single one of my stories. And I said to him, I, you are just, you have no shame at all. <laughs> he said, well, listen, but then when I saw the finished product, and when I very first read it, I will say this. I said to him, I do not want to end that movie a buffoon. You've got to give him some sort of saving grace. And that's when he wrote that wonderful scene in which I approach the young boy and tell him, don't become me, honey. Don't. And, uh, but what a journey. I mean, we did a movie of it. We, um, I've done it all over. I did it with Delta Burke. We toured with it. We went all over the United States with it. Um, quite a, you know, as with everything Dale Shores does, he's so, he's so tenacious. You know it's going to go somewhere, so... Right. Now, we know from your recent comments on Gary Busey that you really don't hold anything back when you talk about some of the other uh, celebrities that you've known over the years. So, um, you know, go ahead and tell us a little bit about, for instance, you just mentioned Delta Burke. In a nutshell, what's your opinion of Delta? Well, I love Delta. Um, I worry about Delta. I don't know where, where she is, what she's doing. We haven't heard from her in a while. Um, I think she's just reclusive. Um, she um, is a joy, you know, to work with, uh, and I, um, you know, she she's still with Gerald. I know that. I check up on that every once in a while. She's still with Gerald McRaney. They're still together, and, you know, gosh, financial problems they've gone through. They've gone through everything, so I don't know where Delta is now. Um, I know that she called Dale. She's a little uh, upset that she wasn't being included because we turned her part over to Caroline Ray, who just gobbled it up. And that was Delta's decision the first time. You know, it's not like we told her. It was Delta's decision. I've got too much on my plate right now. I can't do it. So we turned over to Caroline Ray. Well, then Delta didn't even think. He just has had Caroline Ray, you know, helping him raise money and all this stuff. And apparently he got a call the other day. Delta was a little upset, but... No big dirt on that one. <laughs> well, as we mentioned over dinner a little while ago, um, you know, Caroline Ray, <clears throat> a couple of times I've met her, has been quite a character, too. First time I went to see her, uh, had an appointment for an interview, and she showed up at the door to her own um, hotel room at Disney in uh, curlers and a pink robe. The second time I ran into her, I was on the set for the Donnie and Marie show when they had that over uh, in Hollywood, and she came running in in a pair of sweatpants looking for her next-door neighbor who was a set dresser and had the spare key to her apartment that she had locked herself out of. So uh, what's your opinion of, of Caroline? Is she 
a little... Well, she had a baby, so that kind of slowed her down a little bit. She's so funny. She called one time and she said, Leslie, you've got to help me get out of this. I'm doing an event in Dallas and it's top dollar. And it was a week before the event. She said, I can't do it. Well, I knew with Caroline can't do it meant she got another event, more money. And so I said, well, what do you want me to do? She said, here, I'm going to call them and tell them that you're willing to dress up in drag and just walk out with a blonde wig and say to the crowd, hello, my name is Caroline Ray, and just act like nothing's up. So we put this all together. So uh, I called her recently. And, no, Dale called me about something, and I said, he asked me a favor about something, and I said, listen, Caroline Ray owes me already, big for doing that thing, but it turned out wonderful. It was a huge event in Dallas, and they dressed me in Caroline Ray drag. I looked just like her. <laughs> and I walked out and I said, y'all may know me from The Biggest Loser. And everybody's going, started to scratch. I said, what, what? It's Caroline Ray. They go, blah, 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 blah. What, what? And then I, I, I look backstage and I take my wheel and I go, this ain't a working. <laughs> <laughs> so it was fun. So um, what about your love affair with Dolly Parton? You know, it goes all the way back to I was a, um, in, in college in the 70s in uh, Tennessee. Smoked a little pot back then, and I was getting my little, uh, I had a, a Toyota Celica. <laughs> we didn't know how to pronounce it. The first year it came out, a te Celica. I had a Toyota Celica, and I'd drive up to... Severeville. Severeville to hear her sing in the auditorium and she'd sing Code of Many Colors and we'd cry and then she'd sing uh, My Blue Ridge Mountain Boy and we'd cry and uh, Jolene, oh we'd just sob, could get up off the floor, couldn't even cry. And I've never gotten to meet her ever and I, I have had so many opportunities. Del Shores got to meet her. She wanted him to write something, uh, TV for her. Mm -hmm. He called me after he met her. I said, you tell me everything. I want to know everything. I want to see the video of your meeting with Call her. Call me. He said, Leslie, I went over that 9.30 in the morning. She's in full dolly drag down to the, and said, she's so adorable. The whole time that she's talking to you, she'll adjust your clothes and pet you. And she just real, and I thought, oh, Dale. And he said, but now are you sitting down? Dolly said to me, there's this little actor. I saw him on the Murphy Brown show. He ought to play my brother, and she, she was describing me. And Dale said, "Dolly, he's your biggest fan. He knows you all the way back when you uh, does detergent and you'd win a free dish towel. This is back when she'd say, "What's a country girl without her haystack?" She had a, <laughs> with Porter Wagner, and he, she said, she said, "Well, where is he from?" And Dale said, "He just white trash from the hills of Tennessee." And Dolly said, "Well, honey, aren't we all?" And I've never got to meet her. That's amazing. You would think somewhere your your paths would cross. Oh, they or flew us. the Lane boys gave four thousand dollars to her imagination library. They flew us into Dollywood for a dinner to meet her. She got stuck in traffic getting to the airport in L.A. Here we are in Tennessee. We went to the. Hollywood Bowl to meet her, um, stuck in traffic from the Leno, and she will not do meet and greets afterwards. I mean, she's 60-something, you know? She does, and Well, parts of her are younger. Well, but let me tell you something else. What you don't, you don't know Dolly Parton until you've seen her in concert. 14 instruments. I had no idea. I saw, that was the first time I'd seen her in, in, since, you know, the, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. She's got a show you wouldn't believe. Yeah, she's an amazing woman. She really is. One of my favorite roles that I've seen you in over the years was in a, um, a movie called Eating Out 3. That's more like it. Woo. Free. Now, rip open Rigid Ryan's jeans. You're straight. We're just three dudes having some fun. Now pull. Hard? Maybe. Are you? Oh, shut up. That what? You did. You liked that movie because the boys were naked. My part wasn't three minutes. It wasn't, but it was very entertaining. Oh, you're making that up. You but it, I never see anything mentioned about that. It's almost like it doesn't even appear on your IMDb. It's like oh. you never did it. Well, they begged me and begged me and begged me, and I finally said to my manager, "Eating out three? Where the hell were they for one and two and the?" <laughs> 
Why are they asking old has been here to do part three of a movie I've never even heard of? Well, he, he called me back and he said, Leslie, I cannot get this director off my back. Will you at least have lunch with him? And this guy was so passionate about that. You would have thought we were discussing a Shakespearean drama. He was so passionate in his vision, and this is what I want. Well, it's just trash. It's just <laughs> naked boys. I did have a sweet scene. I you remember. did. It was a great scene. Because I tell the young boy. And you actually, it, that, that alone could almost be a public service announcement for some of the younger gays exactly. to learn about you know where you've been and where what, what the rest our of us history have been. And, and, and you where, boys. you know. You're right. So I was proud of that. But it, uh, um, those kind of movies, I do things like that all the time. I did one not too long ago, and uh, somebody came up to me and said, I just love that series you've got on Logo. And I said, I don't have a series on Logo. Sorted Lives was canceled a long time ago. And he said, nope, you've got a series now on Logo. I said, honey, it's not me. I don't have a series on Logo. Well, I had done this low, low, low-budget film which I'm always up for because I remember years ago I did a low-budget film and there was Ed Asner mm -hmm. and I thought you know what look at him giving back to young actors and I thought so I did this thing I've got a series <laughs> and I've never seen a nickel so I don't know how you can do that uh, did I read something somewhere that one of your uh, one of your idols was um, Truman Capote was it Truman Capote that Truman I Truman Capote um, there were three I discovered when I was about 14, Truman Capote, Christopher Isherwood, and Tennessee Williams. And those three, you know, when they wrote about gay things in the 50s and 60s and even back in the 20s with Christopher Isherwood, it was veiled inferences. Right. But you're a little gay boy, you know, drowning in the lies of the Baptist church, and you're sitting in Tennessee. You know in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof what Skipper and Brick were up to. Right, you can read between you the lines. You knew about, even Big Daddy talks about those two aging sisters, which were two gay men, obviously, Jack Straw and something. You knew, and, and especially with Truman Capote, there were short stories that I would read um, that just gave me, you know, introduced me to... to things that I knew nothing about. Did you ever get a chance to meet him? I did not. He really, he and was, I'm not sure I would have wanted to. Um, he, him or Tennessee or Christopher. They were not known to be the sweetest three on the planet. And then I got a chance uh, to have my picture painted by Don Bacardi who was Christopher Isherwood's young lover and that turned into a friggin' nightmare. It, we'd be here for four hours about <laughs> that one. Yeah, I remember... Um, I went to I went to college in Tennessee, and um, Truman Capote came to speak to our um, our English class uh -huh. while we were there, and um, it was music for chameleons was just coming out, uh -huh. so it was his last work really, and uh, he was so quiet and soft spoken, and you know you almost had to get a you know some kind of a hearing aid or speaker phone or something to hear what he was saying. He was so quiet. But um, I think with all three, with people like that, it took liquor. Yeah. You know what I mean? It took lots of alcohol to get them up and going. And, and that's kind of sad to me. You know, I read in the paper today, Joanne Carson, who Truman met because she wanted to write a biography about herself or something. She's finally getting it written. She's 82 now. <laughs> Johnny's dead, right? right. Johnny Carson, long gone. Right. Now, anyway, which one was Joanne? Joanne was Joanne Carson. He died in her home. Okay. She lived in Palm Beach. Joanne Carson. Because all three third. of his wives were like Joan, Joanne, and Joni, or well, Joanne. They were all the same Joanne name. was the pretty one that he divorced in '73. Okay. So it would be in, wasn't his last one, but she uh, she was best friends with Truman, and Truman would always stay with her. And I'm pretty sure he died in her home. But anyway, she there was the daughter from today. <laughs> <laughs> Next. So, we were talking earlier about some of the uh, more contemporary gays on the scene and how much it's different. I remember when I met um, Quentin Crisp, he was a total, you know, extravagant, effeminate. When I first saw him, actually, I thought it was an elderly woman uh -huh. with the, uh, the thin silk scarf and the long kind of lavender hair and uh -huh. very frail build. Uh -huh. 
But um, these days we see a totally different face on the gay community. And as we were mentioning earlier, uh, for instance, Lance Bass. He, you know, boy band star from the late 90s, early 2000s, and now he's out publicly supporting uh, gay marriage and touting his boyfriend all over the place. How do you think that's changed? And you know, has, has that had an impact on, on your life and the people that you know in Hollywood? Or You know, I, I've just been along for the ride. When I, People ask me what the secret to my success is, and I say, this is it. This is the secret to Leslie Jordan's success. In 1982, when I got off that bus from Tennessee and I discovered West Hollywood and there were queers hanging from the trees, I was home. It didn't matter. I think people come to Hollywood and they say, I'm going to give it five years or I'm going to give it this. Or they get married and they, you know, they're straight. They have to raise kids. Right. It didn't matter with me. I was home, West Hollywood. The acting was what, just something I had to do to keep afloat so I'd get out to the bars. And slowly, I built this amazing, amazing career. And what was wonderful about it, in 1982, West Hollywood was not even incorporated yet, or a city, but it was a, it was a, a community in crises. Um, as we talked a little bit about over dinner, people were dropping like flies. And what we learned was, we have to take care of our own. You know, nobody's going to help us. We couldn't get anybody to help us. And I was one of the founding members of everything. I was around. For, we would meet up at the church at Fairfax and Fountain and cook food. That became Project Angel Food, still going. We would go down and they had a buddy system where you would go to the hospitals and pass out banana popsicles because somebody figured out that the, the AIDS boys, um, their mouths got dry and, and we, we were fearless. The nurses wouldn't even go in there. They were the nurses were dressed like they are today for uh, Ebola. Right. The nurses hazmat suits. Hazmat suits. And here we were just we were fearless. I don't know what it was, but you know that. So in terms of the way things have changed, in those days, I always had gay managers and gay agents. It was very wink, wink. You'd go to the bars every night, and you'd see every producer in town. Right. You'd see every casting person down. But then when you saw them during the day, very wink, wink, you know, and my manager would call me and say, now listen, keep your feet on the ground, keep your hands at your side, and put your voice in the lower register, because they don't want any of that. Back then, the, there were like wink, wink, ne nebbish, mama's boy. They're looking for uh, someone a little light. They'd say a little minty. There were words that mm -hmm. never said gay, queer, anything. Right. And we knew. And now, you know, I'm just, they're catching up with us. I, I never, now had I been some, someone like a Lance Bass, who, if he wanted to act and was young and, and beautiful, and it might have been a lot harder to come out. But I, as people would ask me, now when did you come out? I'd tell them, well, honey, you had to have been in. <laughs> to come out, I fell out of the womb and landed in my mother's high heels. It was a you know different different world back then and different place. You were in the deep south and now you're out in L.A. That's mm -hmm. that's what completely my mother different. tells me. My <laughs> sweet mother, she's 80 now and she says to me now, she got so mad at me the other day. I have a, 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 a I bought some art and this artist now sends me tiny, beautifully framed nudes. But I got like 60 of them. <laughs> and so I was going to donate them to the Mary, Hamburger Mary's Bingo. To, But anyway, I held them up. And in this one particular one, as my friend said, well, no wonder your mother got upset. It was a man on his belly and the pucker was painted. They had the pucker. <laughs> well, my mother, my sisters called and they said, we're warning you, she is on the war path. But that's her thing is that, well, you live out there and... Hollywood. I'm here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and you know, here you have pictures on your Facebook. I said to my sisters, what is she looking at my Facebook for? They said she reads it religiously. And then my heart started going boom, 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 because I started thinking of everything I'd put on there. So you're going to have to join the, the um, drag queen fight on Facebook to be able to use a, a, a fake, fake name, name so your mama can't read the stuff you don't want her to see. My drag name is Baby Wipes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so I understand there's an interesting story that you had about a um, $100 pair of underwear. 
which was a uh, that was a, an embellishment. But I was in locked in the Celebrity Big Brother house, and there was a, a French girl. She was a stripper. She's famous for being on low rent rock of love reality shows with Sharon Osbourne and whatever. And I didn't know who she was, but we didn't get along. And she would hide her food because she was a vegan, and I never could complete my tasks. And I had eaten rice and beans for five days, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I couldn't get any sleep. I was sleep deprived. Uh, sleep deprived. My blood sugar was awry, and she bugged me. She was hiding her food, and I uh, uh, went in and verbally attacked her. I said, you can't hide Brazil nuts, honey. We can all eat those. Right. I don't care if you're a vegan or not. And I, I said, I don't know what happened to you, you know, as a child. Well, she went ballistic on me and got a pair of nail scissors and um, went in. And I had, they weren't a hundred dollars. They were from J uh, Joseph A. Banks. <laughs> they were probably 20 or 30, but they weren't cheap. And she cut my underwear to shreds. And I called her a dirty French slut. And it's all over the internet. And when I got out of the house, I couldn't make it. I've never had name recognition. I've always been, oh, you know him, that funny guy from Will and Grace. Right. Nobody knows Leslie Jordan. And now I can't get down the streets of London. They call me Little Leslie. And they'll go, you dirty French slut. And give me the thumbs up. <laughs> Well, you know, at least they're mentioning your name, right? So they're they're thinking about you. But well, we appreciate you coming by here. Well, thank um, you. And we're glad you're gonna gonna be here for a couple of days. And uh, understand you're going to see your mama this mm -hmm. weekend. So mm -hmm. for pride, <laughs> <laughs> mama, we're gonna celebrate pride. Well, excellent. At the Ruth Chris Steakhouse. <laughs> okay. Do they have a Ruth Chris in Chattanooga? Yes, and Mother's dying to go. Uh oh. She's oh. called it Ruth, Ruth and Chris's Ruth something, but anyway, she's it's brand new. All right then, they're they're high rollers in Chattanooga now. Oh, we've got everything. All right, thank you. Thank you.